We'll begin at uh, Psalm 6. I'm going to read the psalm to you. We'll get into it, and we'll move on to Psalm 7. And depending on how things are flowing, hopefully we'll even go up to Psalm 9 tonight. We'll see. Um, I don't know. Beginning at verse 1, Psalm 6. O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger, nor chasten me in your hot displeasure. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are troubled. My soul also is greatly troubled, but you, O Lord, how long? Return, O Lord, deliver me. O save me for your mercy's sake, for in death there is no remembrance of you. In the grave, who will give you thanks? I am weary with my groaning. All night I make my bed swim. I drench my couch with my tears. My, eyes, my eye wastes away because of grief. It grows old because of all my enemies. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity, for the Lord has heard the voice of my weeping. The Lord has heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. Let all my enemies be ashamed and greatly troubled. Let them turn back and be ashamed suddenly. This is what is called a psalm of lament. The writer is identified for us. It's a psalm of David. And he is receiving chastening from the Lord. Now, the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, in chapter 12, verses 5 and 6, And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him, for whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Revelation 3.19 says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. So in this particular psalm, even as we begin, and I'll take the first three verses together, even in this psalm, David is realizing that he has been suffering through a near-fatal illness and recognizes that in this illness, the Lord has been using it to teach him something concerning his own life. Now, I want you to notice something here as we begin. I want you to notice in verse 1 how he says, O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger, nor chasten me in your hot displeasure. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are troubled. My soul also is greatly troubled, but you, O Lord, how long? I want you to notice that as a righteous man, and this is an important point to begin with, as a righteous man, David is not blaming God and calling him unfair and unloving for allowing him to be ill. As a matter of fact, as a righteous man, he recognizes in the midst of his pain that it's the Lord who's going to deliver him and bring him mercy. There are quite a number of people who, the minute they begin to get ill or go through hard times, instead of casting their concern on the Lord and saying, perhaps God is using this to perfect something in my life that I lack without this, there are quite a number of people who immediately begin to think, what did I do wrong and why is God so mad at me and I've been righteous and how come you're doing this? It reminds me of something we read in the book of Job, in the book of Job chapter 2 verses 7 through 10, where the Bible says that Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of uh, his foot to the crown of his head and he took for himself a pot's herd with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of the ashes. And his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. I appreciate a wife like that. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. And this is the key. Shall we indeed accept good from God? And shall we not accept adversity? And all this Job did not sin with his lips. Think about that for a minute. What, do you think God is supposed to only give me material and physical and spiritual blessings all of my life? Am I only supposed to receive good for all of my life? But, or is God able to deliver both that which is called good and that which is adverse? He said, you're speaking like a foolish woman. Because Job recognized that even in the midst of adversity... God was still God, and God could do a work in his life. Some of us, when we go through hard times, forget that nothing comes to us unless it's first been sifted to the will of God, through the will of God who loves us. And many of us forget that when we go through hard times. The first thing we do, instead of casting our concerns on the Lord and saying, God, deliver me, the first thing we do is we blame him 
and we think that we are better and we don't deserve this and we should be treated better if God is truly good. That's not how David is dealing with it. David recognizes that he receives both good and evil from the hand of the Lord and God uses all of that to work for good in his life. I want you to notice what he says in verse 3 when he says, My soul also is greatly troubled, but you, O Lord, how long? You see, in verse 2, when he said, my bones are troubled, and then in verse 3, my soul is greatly troubled, that word troubled means literally to be dismayed or terrified. I'm going through some, some pretty heavy things, is what he's saying. Somehow I have angered you, and I know that you're disciplining me. And as a result of this, I'm crying out for your mercy. In Psalm 31, verses 9 and 10, he says, Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. My eye wastes away with grief. My soul and my body, my life is spent with grief. My years with sighing. My strength fails because of my iniquity. My bones waste away. So in the midst of all of this, he begins to cry out to the Lord for mercy. But notice also what he says in verse 3 when he says, I think something we've all said, he says, How long? How long is this going to go until you take this away from me? I think this is a question that many of us have asked the Lord when we've been going through hard times in our life. We've said, Lord, how long is this going to happen? You know, I spoke to somebody one day who was sharing with me how that she said to me, a young lady, she said, I'm going through a tremendous trial, and, I, and I'm not going to be able to hold on much longer. She said, it's been going on so long in my life. And I said, really? She says, yes, it's been three weeks. And I, and I said, man, you know, I thought to myself, three weeks, huh? You see, I have kids who are 20-some years old. That's how long I've been going through my trial. <laughs> how long? In Psalm 13, how long, verse 1, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? Well, the answer is that God doesn't forget you. If you take notes, this is a beautiful scripture, Isaiah chapter 49, verse 15. The Lord God speaking to the nation of Israel, but we can apply, I believe, this principle to ourselves. When he says in Isaiah 49, 15, can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget yet I will not forget you. They may forget, but I will not forget you. I'm watching my daughter, Corinne, as she's learning to be a mother to our grandbaby, Josiah. And I'm watching this motherhood blossoming in front of me. And I have to tell you, I'm very blessed to watch the way that my little girl cherishes and loves her son. And she nurses him and cares for him, and the minute he makes a little squeak, she's there caring and loving and holding him. And the other day she was saying, you know, because he gets a little grumpy, he's six months old now, she said, I don't know, Dad. You know, he can be a real brat. And I'm looking at her and saying, no kidding. You're kidding. I wonder where he got that from, you know. He can be so hard-headed. No kidding. I wonder where he got that from. And as we have had the opportunity to become grandparents, Marie and I, as we're holding the baby and he's crying and he does the things that he does, I'm remembering what it was like with my own children now, my children being all grown up and all. And I'm remembering. And so when the Lord says, can a, a woman forget her nursing child? The answer is, well, she can forget certain things about it. You know, memory being what it is has a tendency of erasing much of the bad and only focusing on the good. Uh, but when you have a child like we're having right now, another experience, I'm saying to Marie, yep, I remember what it's like now to stay up late on a Saturday because we were babysitting him the other day. R Corinne Marie never goes out. She went out with a friend for a little while. We watched the baby. He, he wakes up. He wants to nurse. Well, you know, Marie can't help him there. <laughs> and... Uh, we didn't have any cereal to give him or anything, so I was walking him around. It was 11.30 midnight, and I was walking him around, and I turned to Marie, and I said, you know what? I remember something. I remember now when our babies were small, how I used to walk them, and they'd be crying just like this on Saturday night, and I was so tired, and I remember how much I hated this. Call Corinne and bring her home. <laughs> I'm going to take care of her brat. But the Lord says, I will not forget you. To me, that's very important. I don't know about you, but to me, it's very important. 
to know that though I might be forgotten by those who love me the most, God says, no, I will never forget you. So when David cries out and asks the question, how long, it's going to be the right amount of time. That's how long. In verse 4, he continues and says, Return, O Lord, deliver me. In other words, do this now. The way that's being said, it's, Return, O Lord, deliver me now, immediately. O oh, save me for your mercy's sake, for in death there's no remembrance of you in the grave who will give you thanks. So he's saying, I need you, and I need you now, Lord, not later. And I'm asking you, please deliver me immediately. On what basis would the Lord deliver you, David? Well, first... I'm asking on the basis of your mercies. That word mercy is the Hebrew word hesed. And hesed is a close word in Hebrew to what the Greek word agape is. I'm speaking to you concerning your compassionate love for me, your covenantal love. And I'm asking you to deliver me based on your love for me and your mercy. Second, he's saying, if I die, I will not be able to praise you for saving my life. That's what he means when he speaks concerning, in verse 5, in death there's no remembrance of you in the grave who will give you thanks. If I die, then I can't give to you um, all the praise for, for, for actually delivering and healing me. When he speaks concerning that, he's simply saying that the, the physically dead uh, do not remember anything because their physical minds are not in operation. In verse 6, continuing, he says, I am weary with my groaning. All night I make my bed swim. I drench my couch with my tears. My eye wastes away because of grief. It grows old because of all my enemies. I can't sleep, and I'm tired of crying. Anybody here ever experienced that? Now, I look out, and I see some gray hairs like me out there. I think when you're young, uh, you do cry. Sometimes you cry yourself to sleep. And I did more than once as, a, as a, a kid. But I've discovered something. I understand something of what he's saying here when he says, I'm weary from groaning, and I'm tired of crying so much that it feels like I'm swimming in my own tears. God, I need you, and I need you to deliver me right now. And, and Lord, if you don't deliver me, uh, there are going to be people who are going to say that I was evil, and that's the reason why I've died. In Psalm 3, verse 2, uh, the psalmist said, many are they who say of me, there's no help for him in God. So they're going to say I was evil, and that's why I haven't died. So Lord, basically vindicate me. In verse 8, he continues, and he says, depart from me, all you workers of iniquity, for the Lord has heard the voice of my weeping. The Lord has heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. Let all my enemies be ashamed and greatly troubled. Let them turn back and be ashamed suddenly. So as he's praying out and speaking to the Lord, he now speaks to his enemies, and he says, God has heard my prayer, and God will deliver me. Proverbs 15, 29 says, The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. And so the point is, though we may go through suffering, we can be confident that God hears us. And though it may seem to be a prolonged time, it's never too long. It's always the right amount of time. Always. I don't ever want the Lord to take his hand off of me, and I don't know how to say this right. I don't want him to cease working with me until the product that he is producing is present. I don't want him to stop working just because it may be difficult for me or it may be hurtful as I'm going through that. I want to remember that God's mercy is perfect and his compassion towards me is strong. And I want to remember that he loves me no matter what I'm going through, no matter how many tears I might cry, no matter, no matter how, how disappointed I might be in life or how many things have, have occurred that, that work against me. I don't want to be guilty of saying there is no God because if there was a God, he, he would have delivered me. No, I want to say, no, my God has perfect timing and, and he will continue the work until it's complete. And when it's complete, then I'm going to be more like him. And if I can understand that I have a God who loves me, then no matter what I go through, I'll know that it's going to be all right because whatever I'm going through is coming through his will for me, and his will for me is good. And if I can understand that, I'll make it through my trials. Now in Psalm 7, continuing... called a meditation, one, another psalm of David. 
he's dealing with uh, some, uh, some words that have been spoken against him by a man who's known by the name of Cush, who was from the tribe of Benjamin. But Cush is unknown other than the fact that that's how this meditation of David is spoken of. He was a slanderer. He's saying things about David. So this is how David responds. He says, O Lord my God, in you I put my trust. Save me from all those who persecute me and deliver me, lest they tear me like a lion, rending me in pieces while there is none to deliver. So he's saying to the Lord, you are my God and I trust you. When he speaks about putting his trust in the Lord, and I want you to see that in verse 1, uh, the word trust speaks of a refuge. And he's saying, you are my refuge, and you are the one that I can trust. And what he's basically saying in the first two verses is, is simple. If you do not deliver me, then who can and who will? Lord, you are my trust. You are my refuge. In Psalm 18, verse 2, the psalmist says, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. So he's saying, Lord, I know that you take care of me. I know that you will take care of me. I know that you will deliver me from those who are persecuting me. He's saying that they're vicious. That's what verse 2 speaks about. Lest they tear me like a lion, or rending me in pieces where there's no one to deliver. Sometimes pe people can slander and tear you up so bad it's like a lion tearing up a human being. That's the picture he's using. You can be torn up by slander. You know that. People can say things that are cruel, biting, piercing, destructive. And that's how he's picturing this because this one named Cush has been speaking against him. So he says in verse 3, O Lord my God, if I have done this, if there's iniquity in my hands, if I have repaid evil to him who was at peace with me or, or have plundered my enemy without cause, let the enemy pursue me and overtake me. Let him trample my life to the earth and lay my honor in the dust. So basically he's saying, how, how am I going to handle this false accusation? Well, if I'm guilty first, now this is important, if I'm guilty of this, then I deserve punishment. Now let's see how we can make this practical. Sometimes somebody may say something to you or about you that's true. Well, so many of us are so quick to defend ourselves. I understand that impulse, by the way, of course. We're quick to defend ourselves. And sometimes people can say things about us that are simply true, and, and we don't want to hear it. We just we refuse to hear it. I don't know if you ever watch American Idol. <laughs> I do. I, I don't know why, but I do. And I'm watching it last night. And I'm watching somebody who cannot sing getting very angry and arguing that one day they're going to make millions of dollars. And I'm watching, and I'd say, yeah, in comedy, but never in singing. I mean, please help me. It's very tragic to watch some of these. And the word last night was, was used by Simon the Monster Man. It was, uh, he's one of the judges, and he said, I have never seen so many who are deluded. And I told Marie, I said, that's a great word. That's exactly true. People actually stand in line, 10,000 of them, you know, sleeping out for two days, three days, so they can stand in front of three judges and perform as, as well as they can with a, an honest belief that they are the next person that's going to thrill America with their voice. And then they, they let out a few squawks and, <laughs> and everybody goes, oh my, uh, this is absolutely bad. And then somebody honestly says to them, you know, I hate to tell you, but you're hurting me, stop. And, uh, and then they get insulted and they go home and cry. But do you want to know something, guys? Well, we may not be out there singing tunes sometimes, but our lives are out of tune. And somebody who loves us and speaks the truth to us and says, do you want to know something? You're not hitting the mark. You're off tune here. We can do exactly the same thing. We can. And we can say, no, you, you know, you know, you're tone deaf. You just don't hear the quality of my life. When in reality, no, I, I, I can see very clearly. You are not living up to what you, you say. And we do the same kind of thing. Well, listen, 
one of the things that we have to learn to do, and I say this to myself, and this is something that I do, is if somebody has a complaint or somebody has a criticism towards me, I, I, I can't honestly say that, that I enjoy that. It's not like I, I, I'm longing for that. You know, I'm like anybody else. Things can hurt, and the way they're said can hurt, of course. But I've learned over the years to take those things to the Lord and to say, Lord, if there's truth in this, then I have to change. If there's truth in this, I have to change. I, I started learning that early in, in Christian life just as a believer, and it was hard to do that. And then, then God made me work out all the time when I got married. And Marie sees things in me that, that I don't see and then has the nerve <laughs> to tell me, who are you anyway, and where were you, you know, until I picked you up out of the gutter and brought you to Jesus? No. <laughs> She's not here. <laughs> She's having a meeting. You know what I'm trying to say? I'm trying to say this. If there's truth in what's being said, we better hear it. And that's what David is saying. He's saying, Lord, if I have done this, then deal with me. But the interesting thing about this is he has integrity and knows that he hasn't done that. He asserts his integrity here at this point. And notice what he says in verse 6. Arise, O Lord, in your anger. Lift yourself up because of the rage of my enemies. Awake for me to the judgment you have commanded. So the congregation of the peoples shall surround you. For their sake, therefore, return on high. The Lord shall judge the peoples. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness, according to my integrity within me. So he says, Lord, you are the one who defends. Now notice how he says it, though. He says, arise. He says, lift yourself up. He says, awake for me. Return on high. He's saying, Lord, act on my behalf. Though I would be willing to pay whatever penalty is necessary if these things are true, the fact is what is being said about me is not true, and therefore I ask that you would act for me. Judge between us. Demonstrate that I'm not guilty of these things that are being said about me. In verse 9, let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end, but establish the just, for the righteous God tests the hearts and minds. My defense is of God who saves the upright in heart. I've discovered normally it's not worth the time trying to defend yourself against false statements. I have discovered that if you do defend yourself, people will believe what they want to believe anyway. And if you try to defend yourself, you're going to look petty and even more guilty. And so, a long time ago, I began to make the decision to let God deal with it. You know, because some of us, especially ministers, are in the public's eye. And, well, you're looking at one person right now. I'm looking at several hundred. And so what happens is my faults can be much more clear than those that are hidden within a congregation. And so sometimes people will say, I don't like the way you did this or the way you said that. Or... And I learned a long time ago, if I were to come up in front of you all the time and say, listen, by the way, I received a letter that says this, or somebody stopped me and told me that, and I'm always defending myself, what good is it? The more you do that, the more you look guilty. So a long time ago, I, I, I learned to do what David is teaching. Lord, you defend me. You take care of my honor. You are my shield. You are my defense. I can't waste my time always trying to prove that I didn't do what's being said. And you can put your head on your pillow at night and you can sleep because you know who's in charge and you know who's in control and you know that God is just and God is righteous and he takes care of you. And basically, that's what the, uh, David is saying. My defense is of God who saves the upright in heart. God is the one who tests the hearts and minds. In verse 11, God is a just judge. God's angry with the wicked every day. If he does not turn back, he'll sharpen his sword. He bends his bow and makes it ready. He also prepares for himself instruments of death. He makes his arrows into fiery shafts. Well, basically, this is a picture of God's righteous judgment. And I want you to notice the image of God here. He is the warrior God. And he is the one in verse 11 who is angry with the wicked every day. 
Well, Jesus said, or rather John 3.36, John the Baptist said, uh, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. He who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. And so the Lord is angry with the wicked every day. And God is the one who judges. That's what he means in verse 13 when he says he prepares for himself instruments of death and makes his arrows into fiery shafts. Behold, verse 14, the wicked travails with iniquity, conceives trouble, brings forth falsehood. He made a pit and dug it out. He has fallen into the ditch which he made. His trouble shall return upon his own head, and his violent dealing shall come down on his own crown. And so he's saying the wicked are pregnant with evil and gives us a picture of a woman who gives birth to babies. And the point he's making is er, uh, he's saying evil can only produce evil. That's what evil produces. Evil does not produce good. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 17 through 19, Jesus said it this way. He said, Every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And so he's simply saying that the evil will produce evil, and that's what happened. But ultimately, verse 16, his trouble returns upon his own head. In verse 17, I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness and will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. Though I have been slandered and though I have been attacked, David is saying, I'm still going to praise the Lord. Why are you going to do that, David? Well, I'm going to do that because my trust is in the Lord, that's why. And I'm going to do that because God has a way of vindicating. And I'm going to trust him because I know that he will do that. Pastor Chuck Smith, my pastor, once taught us something that has stuck with me. When asked a question about defending yourself, he said, well, I have options. He said, I can fight on my own behalf, but I don't win every fight. Or I can allow the Lord to be my defense, and God never loses a fight. He said, it just makes sense to me to go with the one who never loses. My God is my defense. And when you have that mentality, when you know God will vindicate you, you can put your head on a pillow at night, go to sleep, and sleep in peace, because God's in control. And that's what David is saying. Even though Cush is making these statements, slandering him, David says, now I'm going to trust in you, Lord. You'll take care of everything. Psalm 8. This is another psalm of David. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, you who set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and infants you have ordained strength because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained. What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. This is a very famous psalm. It's been called a hymn of praise. It's a hymn of praise to the creator of the universe. And it's intended to pray, praise God. And I want you to see this, to praise God above all creation. You need to remember that pagans worship nature. Pagans glorify it. But not so with us. We do not worship creation. We worship the creator. That's a difference. Now, in Romans chapter 1, verse 25, the apostle Paul speaks of how pagans worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. And so we have people today who go out to the beach or go into the forest or spend time in the desert or climb a mountain. And they will tell you that they that that's where they get in touch with God. And, and very often, modern paganism is so confused because it has a tendency of looking at creation and, and forgetting that every house had to be built by someone and he who built all things is God. 
And so what David is doing is simply teaching us that rather than giving praise to the creation as wonderful and beautiful as it is, even in a fallen world, still the one who created that ought to be given honor and not the creation itself. And that's why he begins in verse 1 by giving praise to the Lord. And that's why he says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, you who set your glory above the heavens. You are greater than all things, is what he is saying. You are, you are the one that we ought to glorify. When he says, O oh Lord, how excellent is your name, that word excellent speaks of that which is majestic, noble, or great. And he's saying, God, you are the mighty God. You are the king of the universe. You're not a tribal God localized in a certain tribe or nation. You are the God of the universe. And I give you praise for what you have done. I can remember when I was a brand new Christian, I was in San Luis Obispo. There's a there's a, um, a spot by the ocean that I was with some, a friend of mine, and we were walking on the pier. And as we walked on the pier, and we walked and began just to look at the beauty of creation and all, there was a guy who had, he was uh, crabbing, he was getting crabs, and he had this little basket, and he had dropped it into the water there. And uh, we walked up to him and smiled at him and said, hi, how you doing? And he said, fine. He was a guy about my age, a little older than me. And I can still remember this friend of mine named Jim and I walking up to him saying, hi, how are you? And the guy said, fine. And he goes, what are you guys doing? You know, and real friendly guy. And, and I turned to him. I was a brand new Christian. I hadn't been a Christian for more than two or three weeks. And I remember looking at him and I said, you know what we're doing? He goes, what? I said, we're just praising God for the beauty of his creation. And he looks at me and says, are you a Christian? And I said, yes, I, I just opened my heart to Jesus Christ just a few weeks ago. He says, I'm a believer too. And he began to share with me, to make a long story very short, his name was Tom. And he said to me, when did you give your heart to Christ? And I said, December 27th, about three weeks ago. He said, where at? I said, at a Maranatha concert at the Hollywood Palladium. He said, you were at that concert? And I go, yeah. He goes, I played at that concert. I said, you did? He goes, yeah, I was up there playing. I said, wow, I didn't even, Wow. And, you know, we, we just immediately, like, he invites us to his house, and he made those crabs for us. I'd never eaten crab in my life before, and he made crab for us. You know, I never ate anything without beans and rice. I mean, crab, you've got to be kidding. And what is this, you know? Eating spiders wasn't my thing at all, you know. But, you know, it was just as simple as saying we're just blessing God. We weren't looking at the ocean and, you know, mm, you know, you know, and count the stars, you know. No, no, because every house is built by some man, the writer of Hebrews tells us. He who built all things is God. And so you give glory to the God who did that. Now notice in verse 2 when he says, Out of the mouth of babes and infants you have ordained strength because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. So basically he's making it very clear to us, very clear to us, that even infants, even the young, can recognize the reality of something greater than themselves. And he points to that in verse 3 when he says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained, what is man? That you are mindful of him, the son of man, that you visit him. You made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. And what this picture's for us, and I want you to see that in verse 3, is, is God is a sculptor. I consider your heavens the work of your fingers. God as a sculptor. It shows us the immensity of God by contrasting his fingers with a universe. That's the point he's making, how immense the God is that we worship. And he's carefully crafting the universe. Again, we don't give pa glory to paintings. We don't give glory to, to a statue. We see that statue or that painting as having an originator, an originator who sculpted or who painted. So it would be foolish, of course, for us to walk up to a, to a beautiful uh, portrait or a beautiful you know, picture and, and to speak to that picture. Oh, picture, you are so pretty. You know, oh, statue, how gorgeous thou art. I know we, we, we say, who did that? Who did that? Man, they have talent. And they say, well, he's right over there. She's over there. They're the one who'd painted it. And if you're anything like me, 
when I'm really touched by something, and if the artist is over there, I'll walk up to him and I'll say, did you paint that over there? Yeah, I did. I just got to tell you, that is the most beautiful painting I think I've seen in a long time. So who do you give credit to? The one who performed the work, right? Even a child knows that. Even a child knows that. But God's enemies refuse that. They say, no, that just happened by chance. I remember a guy I used to work with. I used to work just down the street at a place here called, um, I think it was called FMC. And uh, I can still remember they make street sweepers and things like that, and I was working in one of the departments, and a friend of mine was a believer who was ministering to another guy, and they worked the line where they were, they were putting together the street sweepers. And this friend of mine was, was uh, sharing with this guy and said to the guy that he was a Christian. My friend's a Christian. And the guy says, I don't believe in God. He says, I'm, I'm, I, I just don't. He says, I, I, and so my friend says, then how did everything begin? Can you tell me? And he says, well, I think it just exploded into existence. He says, really? He said, you think it exploded into existence? He goes, yeah. His friend of mine, you know, looks, and there's this street sweeper, this big old sweeper standing, you know, basically all assembled in front of him. And he, he said, you see that sweeper there? And he says, yeah. He says, you know what happened? He goes, no, what? He says, you know, last night there was an explosion here in the factory. <laughs> and, it, and it came into existence. And he goes, oh, it didn't. He said, no, of course it didn't. He said, if that street sweeper required someone to put it together, why do you think the universe didn't require a designer? And that was a good question. It didn't explode into existence, and that's the point he's making. He says, I consider when I meditate on, when I evaluate, when I discern the heavens, what is man? In, in your fingers put all things, the, the moon and the stars and all the planets. Are, it's like you just brought them into existence. He says, and then there's puny man. Then what is man? That you are mindful of him. That word mindful, who is man that you should even think upon him or even remember him at all? Or the son of man that you should visit him, that you actually have relationship with us. You who created all things, you desire to know me and you think about me. It's intended to humble us as we think about that. He says, you have made him a little lower than the angels and have crowned him with glory, in verse 5, with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, sheep, oxen, beasts of the field, birds of the air, fish of the sea, that pass through the paths of the seas. Obviously, as you read through your Bible, in the very beginning, God created man to have dominion and to govern. Of course, in a fallen world, we don't see that completely fulfilled in our life. Initially, we are created with that ability to have dominion, and still, we still subject the world to some degree. But this has a perfect fulfillment in Jesus Christ. It has perfect fulfillment in Him. If you take notes, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 6 through 9. One testified in a certain place saying, What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not see, we do not yet see all things put under him. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. So what he's saying is this is perfectly fulfilled when Jesus returns to rule and reign on the earth. This is one of the Psalms that is quoted in the New Testament. Now when he says in verse 9, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, he returns to the praise of God, the God who made all things and the God who is worthy of praise. Moving into Psalm 9, I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will tell of all your marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in you. 
I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. I want you to see something. Notice in verse 1, I will praise you with my whole heart. I will tell of all your marvelous works. When your heart is filled with praise for God, this is really basic but very important. When your heart is filled with praise to God, when you love the Lord, it is not hard to talk about Him. It isn't. It is not hard to talk about God when you love Him, when you're in love with Him. It's, it's really not. It, it, you know, when, uh, how do you, you know, when our first baby was born, when all of our babies were born, I did it with all of them, I didn't, I didn't go to work the next day kind of keeping it a secret that we had a baby, you know, to myself. I mean, I, I, I never have done that, you know, obviously, right? I mean, everybody, you know, even if you don't want to hear the name Marie in a Bible study, you will hear it. You know, it just comes out. I don't plan that. I don't have in my notes, talk about Marie here, you know, talk about Corinne here, you know, put down David there. I, I, don't, I don't do that. It just comes out, it, and that's just the way it is, you know. And, and, and I don't even realize, frankly, that I do that. I, I really don't. I have people say things to me, and I, I I'm, really, I don't even realize I do that. It just naturally just flows out. That's just the way it is. But I discovered why I do that. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And I discovered something that you have discovered too. I discovered that when you're in love with someone, everybody's going to know. They're all going to know. Everybody's going to know. You know the old saying, ladies, she must be in love. Be look, at, look how beautiful she is. There's this saying like that. She must be in love. Look how beautiful she is. Love, in other words, produces something in her that is beautiful about her. Or when a mama holds her baby for the first time, there's a beauty in that that, that just sticks with you if you have the joy and opportunity to see that. There's just something about that. And it just pours out of you. Well, I've discovered that when you, when you just love the Lord, when you spend time with God, when you pray and you get into the Word and, and you have friends who love Him too, you're going to share. There's so many people who get caught up saying, teach me how to, how to be a witness. Teach me how, you know, in, in essence they're saying, give me scriptures that will help me to be that. I've discovered if you spend time conversing with the Lord and is marking your Bible down and saying, oh, this is a good thing here. Oh, God, you're speaking to my heart now. You're going to have plenty to talk about. You will have plenty to talk about. Because it's going to be in your heart. And, and that's what happens. Listen, when he says, I'm going to praise you with my whole heart, he also says, I will tell of all your marvelous works. Lord, I love you so much and I'm praising you so much that I can't help but talk about you. And I, and I, and I do naturally. I, I don't have to, you know, drum some courage up inside of me and say, oh, you better talk. Oh, you better talk. Oh, you're not a good one. You're not saying anything. No, I just, it just comes out naturally. It's what my life is all about. I have a friend of mine who... I mentioned earlier, his name is Jim, and Jim was with me there in San Luis Obispo on the pier and all, but Jim was in the military. He took off for a while, didn't see him for another year, year and a half. I went into the military. I got out a couple years later. We were disconnected for a while, and I went to see him, was visiting with him, and he told me some things, and we visited and all, and then he moved away, and I hadn't seen him in years. He came to visit me. About It's been 15 years now, last time I saw Jim, but he came to visit me, and, and I was home. I invited him over. He had moved to Minnesota. I hadn't seen him. He was a close friend of mine in high school. I'd known him since I was a little boy and all, and had him over, visited with him, and I'll see you later, Jim. You know, hope to see you again sometime, and I didn't see him. Hadn't seen him. He didn't call again, and I didn't see him, and about, uh, about five years ago now, I was talking to his sister, who's a Christian, goes to Calvary Chapel in Downey. Her name's Sue. And Sue said, you really made Jim mad. I, I said, what? She said, you really made him mad. She said, he said you were shoving Jesus down his throat. And I said, you know what, Sue? I said, to be honest with you, so that's it. I said, to be honest with you, I didn't, I'm real sensitive to the fact that Jim gets offended, and I didn't say hardly anything other than a couple times I said, well, thank God he's been good to me. Oh, well, she said, well, he said you were just shoving Jesus down his throat all night long. And you know, some people get offended like that. But I wasn't even realizing that I was just blessing the Lord in some very simple thing. Now, I might have said more than that. The only thing I remembered was just saying, hey, God has been good to me. The Lord has blessed me. I'm now a pastor in this church, and he's wonderful. Some very basic things. And I discovered that if, if the Lord's in your heart like that, if you, you, you're just going to praise Him. Some people like it, some people don't. Some people are attracted, some are put off. But the bottom line is, I'm going to praise you, and I will tell of your marvelous works. 
That's what the psalmist is saying. Now, moving on, he says, when my enemies turn back, in verse 3, they, they shall fall and perish at your presence, for you have maintained my right and my cause. You sat on the throne judging in righteousness. You rebuked the nations. You have destroyed the wicked. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. O oh, enemy, destructions are finished forever, and you have destroyed cities. Even their memory has perished. So he's praising God because God vindicates him. And the way that he did is he destroyed those who were his enemies. Notice in verse 6 how he speaks of their names being blotted out forever. In other words, they're not even mentioned even in this song. In Proverbs 10, verse 7, the Bible says, The memory of the righteous is blessed, but the name of the wicked will rot. In verse 7, the Lord shall endure forever. He has prepared his throne for judgment. He shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall administer judgment for the peoples in uprightness. The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. And those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. And so God is righteous, and God judges properly. For those who know his name and trust him, he says he's a refuge and he preserves them. Notice verse 10 how he says, you have not forsaken those who seek you. Isaiah 46, 4 says it this way, even to your old age I am he. Even to gray hairs I will carry you. I have made and I will bear. Even I will carry and will deliver you. It's one thing to carry around a baby it's another thing when that baby's full grown and God says, and I'll still carry you around. Now, that's a beautiful picture. My mom tries to pick me up every once in a while. But it's a picture of love, isn't it? It's a picture of saying, I'll be with you and I'm going to vindicate you and I will carry you. He says in verse 11, sing praises to the Lord who dwells in Zion. Declare his deeds among the people. When he avenged blood, avenges blood, he remembers them. He does not forget the cry of the humble. In other words, we who have been afflicted should sing praise to the one who delivers us. We also should share with others how great God has been in our affliction. One of the greatest things you can do is to remember to thank God for delivering you, to thank God for, for bringing you out of those times of affliction. One of the things that I'm asking the Lord to help me to become is more thankful and more grateful in everything. Because it's easy for us to, to lose sight of the, the daily blessings, the, the, the daily mercies that God gives to us, to be able to wake up and actually to put two feet into a pair of shoes is, is something that is a blessing that God gives to us. To, to have said that we slept in a bed last night and had a blanket that kept us warm is a real blessing. To say that we had something to eat, sometimes even more than once in the same day, is a real blessing. To be able to put your hand on a wallet that has some money so you can stop at, at a store and buy yourself something or go to a, get a hamburger is something we ought to be grateful for. And the Lord has been trying to train me in that because in so many ways I can forget to be thankful for the small things. But God not only gives us those things, but He also delivers us. He delivers us from affliction. He delivers us from those who would be oppressing us. And that's what the psalmist is crying out to God and thanking Him for. Now notice he says in verse 11 and 12, Sing praises to the Lord who dwells in Zion. Declare His deeds among the people. Thank God for all that He does. When He avenges blood, He says, He remembers them. He doesn't forget the cry of the humble. Have mercy on me, O Lord. Consider my trouble for, from those who hate me. You who lift me up from the gates of death, that I may tell of all your praise in the gates of the daughter of Zion. I will rejoice in your salvation. The nations have sunk down in the pit which they made. In the net which they hid, their own foot is caught. The Lord is known by the judgment he executes. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. And then he says, think about that. Selah. Lord, as you have delivered me, the result will always be the same. I will praise you and I will thank you. And even as he says in verse 15 about the nations sinking down into the pit they've made and being caught in their own net, the evil designs of the wicked will be their own undoing. God's judgment will be fair and just. The wicked make their own bed and they ultimately sleep in it. Proverbs 5.22 says, His own iniquities entrap the wicked man and he is caught in the cords of his sin. Again, either you can avenge yourself or you can allow the Lord to vindicate you. But you have to make a choice. Verse 17, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. For the needy shall not always be forgotten, 
The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. Arise, O Lord, do not let man prevail. Let the nations be judged in your sight. Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. The wicked shall suffer judgment for the rejection of God. When he says in verse 17, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God, the word forget speaks about not honoring him or keeping him in their minds. They displace him with other things and the result is they're going to be in eternal judgment. But when he cries out in verse 19 and says, Arise, O Lord, do not let man prevail, it's not because David is vengeful. You could see that and think that. You might say, well, look at him. No, it's not that he's vengeful. It's that he wants God to be honored. He's got a zeal for the honor of the Lord. And his real concern is that the nations will fear God because when they, when they learn to fear him properly, they're going to honor him. Again, and we'll close with, with this again, if there's anything this nation that we live in really needs, it's a good dose of the fear of the Lord. It's a good dose of the fear of the Lord. The Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. It goes on to say, Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. To fear the Lord means to depart from evil. And I really believe that in the fear of the Lord, there is life. And when we begin to cry out to the, to the Lord for this nation, God, we are aware that those who don't have a relationship with you will perish. And this nation does not have a healthy fear of you. We have seasonal fear, not necessarily of the Lord, but a sense of his presence or a sense of need when we have national tragedies. And before you know it, every church is filled with people who show up for prayer and for help. And then when everything settles down, we go right back to the way that we were living before. But the Lord says, no, that's not the way it ought to be. And so David is simply saying, Lord, nations, the nations that do not fear you, that reject you, that re do not remember you, they will be turned into hell, into eternal judgment. So my desire is that they may fear you. Why, David? so that they might have life. Now, David couldn't do a whole lot by himself, but his writings inspire people like us to leave a place like this, to live in the fear of the Lord tomorrow, and even as we walk out, and maybe impact somebody else's life. So may the Lord use the study of his word to inspire us to serve him, to grow in our knowledge of his ways, and to fear him, that our lives might be blessed by him and that we might be a testimony of his grace.